Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Coffee and Football, presented by Rick Bavro and Austin Underground. I'm your host, Blake Monroe, where I'm joined this morning by Bobby Burton and Jerry Hamilton. Spring ball is underway. We're going to talk about it, talk about recruiting a lot more. But first, be sure to tell us where you're checking in from, what you're drinking this morning. We love to see and hear, hear all that good stuff. And Bobby, you were actually at the practice yesterday for the media viewing window. What were some of your key takeaways? Oh, you know, I think that let's start with the health of the team. Uh, Manny Muhammad was out uh, again. He's just got, look, based on what I've been told, he's got a tweaked hamstring. So it's not anything long term, but it's something to monitor and not mess with, right? You don't want to go out there and be silly and have him be out for two more weeks, right? Uh, so just uh, let that be. Uh, beyond that, I felt like uh, the Quinn Ewers and Arch Manning continued to look good, Ewers in particular. Uh, looked very confident uh, after uh, the practice itself. Uh, like I really, really liked how Quinn Ewers handled the media. I uh, talked about not only how he came to the decision of why he would stay an extra year, uh, but then talked about what he had learned after the fact, you know, about from his really journey through uh, time at Texas and uh, post high school. Uh, I, I feel like uh, I, I say this and I don't mean to, to, you know, be over, make make the words have too much meaning. I guess is the right way to put it. He's got a he's got a sense right now of who he's becoming and who he wants to be as a man. That's kind of who I how I feel. I mean, when he showed up at Texas, he's eighteen. Now he's twenty. You know what I mean? He he is developing as a person uh, and as a player simultaneously. He talked a lot about what he wanted to do. In the future, he felt like the first year he was just trying to hold on to the steering wheel. Last year, he guided the steering wheel a little bit. This year, he feels like he's got command of the car, right? It's a little bit different. And that's where he, I think he wants to just keep getting better as a quarterback. So that was that was a takeaway. Uh, and then on the defensive side of the ball, uh, you know, in, in reflection, I've, I've thought about it and uh, in, in, uh, talked a little bit about it here. I just think they're really, really talented at defensive end right now. Um, and I, I, I'm hard, it's hard for me to believe that. Right. But they added three guys in, uh, not only did they add, uh, Trey Moore, a young man out of UTSA, but Colin Simmons, Zena, and then you have Baron Sorrell who came back. Ethan Burke is back. It looks like Colton Vosick is healthy for the first time, um, in a while. And so I actually think that was a big takeaway for me. It's, it's kind of dual sided where a year ago you would have said that was the big question mark heading into heading into spring practice, right? Who's going to be the edge opposite Baron Sorrell? Well, I mean, I, I actually think that that could be a, a, a team strength going into to 2024. Yeah, I agree. I I, I agree 100% with Bobby uh, at edge position. Uh, you know, look, I, I think we're going to be talking about – we don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but I think we're going to be talking about Trey Moore as a top two defensive player on this team. Uh, him, him and Anthony Hill very well could be the two best players on defense. Everything I'm hearing, I mean, because, look, I put some notes up on on Texas football, but, you know, he's considered a pass rush guy, pass rush guy, right? He's so twitchy, and that's where if you watch highlights, that's a lot of highlights of him at UTSA. Uh, but he has shown the ability to set the edge, too, early on. So, uh, you know, and, and, and Colin Simmons is going to be a disruptive guy that creates some chaos as a young player. A lot to learn that goes with that, you know, as far as assignment football. So uh, that's going to be a process for him. Uh, but you mentioned Colton Vosick. I mean, Colton Vosick looks great physically. It's just a matter of being healthy. I mean, that's a guy that before the nagging injuries began, he was being talked about as a guy that could have pushed his way into the rotation as a true freshman. So that he was making a strong impression before the injury bug uh, kind of kicked in for him. But, you know, I thought Barrett Sorrells looked really good in the practices I've been at physically technically um in drills he just he just gets it i mean he's he's maximizing his talent whatever he's get, he can he's maximizing it bobby we use this term around here he is the adult in the room yeah that's what he's he's grown into after 4 years at texas he is the adult in the room i'll tell you i felt the same way about david benda yesterday uh at the uh post practice media availability as well he is an adult now that doesn't mean he's going to be an A plus plus player. That that's a different story, but I get the distinct feeling neither one of those guys are going to get cut short at the line, 
if that yeah, makes sense. They're not going to do. They're not going to give every ounce of what they have and what they can be to the cause. And I think others will follow that and understand that as part of the whole process. So, and football's, in, you know, it's eleven on eleven. It's not one on eleven. Right. Uh, so those guys have a have a space. I think Sorrell, Jerry, we talked about this two years ago. His body was morphing. Yeah. I mean, he came in skinny. He looks and a lot so, bigger. He looks a lot bigger than uh, Justice Finkley, guys. Oh my God, he's, he's, he's much bigger. That Justice is just not very tall. Right. Justice is thick. It's just, but the 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 reality of it is, is he keeps gaining the right kind of weight. And if there is a poster boy for development at the University of Texas on the defensive side of the ball right now, it's Baron Sorrell because he has put everything he has into it, and it's clear that they put him on a path. To get everything out of himself too, uh, he looks he looks like a million bucks right now. Bobby, talk about. Uh, I thought it was interesting. David Ben to mention Ty Anthony Smith yesterday. Yeah, because look, it, it, you can with seventeen early enrollees. If you're one of the guys that needs some time physically, right, to develop, you're not going to get talked about as much, right? You're not going to be the guy that people see initially when players walk out on the field. And notice, right? Uh, but I thought it was interesting that Benda brought up Ty Anthony Smith because for those that haven't – and we're not saying this year with Ty Anthony. He needs time. But the one thing I'll say about being at Jasper twice to see Ty Anthony, talking to Coach Crumity and that staff down there about Ty Anthony, uh, war at first physically, he needs some time to develop, but he's got a 79, 80-inch wingspan at six one and a half. So if you like long arms at linebacker and you like a linebacker that played running back, took snaps, split out, played receiver, played safety, played linebacker, brought him off the edge. This is your guy, that small-town guy who had to do a lot for a high school team, uh, helped that team get deep into the playoffs, district MVP. Uh, very – the thing I was told at, at Jasper by the staff is cerebral football player. So they could put a lot on his plate, and they weren't worried about him being able to handle it all. So – now and I thought he was an instinctive player at linebacker as well. So it was nice, Bobby, to see Ben to mention him because he's not going to get mentioned a lot in the next year, uh, probably because there's other experienced players. There's guys that are going to be playing, taking the snaps on Saturday. But it's nice to see here a young guy mentioned by a, an experienced linebacker. He also talked about Darian Gallet uh, yeah. as well, which is good good to hear because you don't hear his name much, even though he's extraordinarily talented. Um, look. I, I noticed Ty, Ty Anthony running around yesterday. Leonga LaFau is another young one that I think is going to have some. I actually think LaFau, out of those three, is probably going to have more time right. on the field this year. Um, uh, it, it's interesting to me. Uh, what we're talking about here is depth uh, a little bit. Um, and I think just Texas is having it right now. Every position, I think, has depth on defense. Every single position except for defensive tackle. I just, I, you know. And it's more over the ball. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is because Dre Bledsoe is so talented. It, but but they're not, there's not enough. Yeah. There's just not enough. I mean, uh, that that's that's the, the question I have is, first of all, Alfred Collins looks like the best of the group right now without question. I mean, he looks like he's, his body's continued to grow, which is a good sign. I really want to say that. I think that's a really good sign for Texas. Sabaya is a little thicker maybe than what you think he is. Yes. So I, I, even though he's, he, I think he came in at 295 or whatever, he looks a little thicker on the trunk. Uh, so he can actually anchor probably a little bit better. Vernon Broughton is getting better, but still not that anchor type body shape. He just doesn't have a, that, that, and, uh, you know, a lot of talk about Aaron Bryant. I mean, he's a little undersized still. Uh, and then Mike, uh, or uh, excuse me, uh, Alex January, as well as uh, Sadir Mitchell. Hey, by the way, I want to say this because we, a lot of people have given negative remarks about Sadir Mitchell. Uh, so first of all, we do think he, he has some uh, medical issues going on that we've talked about prior, but it, I thought he had a very good uh, practice yesterday. Very, very good. Like he was bopping around early in drills, had the good energy to him. You know, I, so don't, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater quite yet on him. He had a good practice yesterday. Now, the question with, with Sadir and a lot of these guys is, can he keep building on those the next time, the next time, the next time, so they, they can start to see some consistency out of him? 
All right, guys, like I said, we're going to talk about recruiting here in a minute. We've got lots of questions about spring practice that we're going to get into. But first, Bobby, can you tell folks out there about Rick Volvro and Austin Underground? Absolutely. Rick Volvro is a good friend of the program and uh, just a really all-around good guy. He and his team at Austin Underground have specialized in difficult underground commercial installations since 2004. The team's engineering background gives Austin Underground the ability to perform work other firms often consider just too risky. Rick and his team offer an end-to-end -end, uh, client experience, including seamless communication, budgeting, staffing, and top-notch trade partners. And most importantly, they produce solid quality work every time that you can depend on. That's Austin Underground. They also have another company called Texas Road that can work in conjunction with one another. So if you have difficult underground and commercial installations that you need and road work, give the guys at Austin Underground or Texas Road a shout, Rick and his team, just tremendous. Okay, well, we do want to think. Like, I got to call you out real quick. Uh, what's up? It's opening day at base of MLB, and you have no Rangers stuff on. Uh, <laughs> after, so, stuff, after dancing on this show for months and going to parades and stuff, you have no Rangers gear on. What the heck? I, I know. So listen, I I obviously have a Cubs hat on, but when my son plays, which is today, I say the C's for Comanche. And then I got the pink match in the pink. I actually have the same blue Nike shoes on. So see, it's a whole outfit. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, you're making up for it. You're uh, making up for it. Yeah, so there we go. But yes, it, is, it definitely is opening day. I'm excited. Uh, not going to get to watch much of it because my son plays two hours away from here. But that's okay. I'd rather, I'd rather go see him anyway. Well, Jerry, tell us about recruiting. I know you got lots of uh, news and notes there. What's the latest? Yeah, I'll start with a little DB recruiting. Uh, I, I had a chance to catch up with Dorian Brew a little last night. Um, he's going to be at Ohio State this weekend, by the way. Has that official visit uh, scheduled for uh, June 21st through 23rd. USC has will get an official visit as well. I think that date is scheduled. Uh, I, he's going to visit Texas officially. I think that's leaning to June 14th through 16th. I think they're just trying to finalize some stuff. Uh, chance that he, he's on campus in April. Um, but that's going to depend a lot on track. You know, uh, obviously he's uh, parents are both world class track athletes. He's a he runs in, in the hundred and on the relays for Conroe High. They have district meet coming up in a couple of weeks. So, you know, that April 6th visit date for some of those kids is, is depends on when their district meet is, can knock them out. Uh, but there's a chance he's back on campus in April. I think, look, it's one of the real national recruiting battles in the state of Texas that Texas is in on uh, with Ohio State, where his mom's in the Hall of Fame. LSU is going to get an official visit, obviously, where his, where his father uh, is. If they have a Hall of Fame and he's not in it, he should be. Um, and obviously, Corey Raymond's all in there. Uh, Texas, USC, Ohio State, and, and probably Oregon. I think those are going to be your five. So it, it runs the gamut. It's a national re recruitment. Uh, there you see Brew, a uh, really strong kid, physical kid, uh, can run in the 10 7, 10 8 range at 6'2, 200 pounds. Uh, so thicker frame. Uh, he's not built like his dad. His dad's still built like an Olympian. Honestly, I was watching him coach the track team at Connor High. The athletic period does that a few weeks ago. Dorian's a thicker built guy, uh, more of a football build. Uh, but again, one of the big national recruitments uh, out there for the Longhorns. And uh, Cortland Guillory uh, out of Klein Oak, a DB who will officially visit June 7th through 9th. He was at Texas practice on Saturday. Uh, he's a guy that Texas continues to uh, take a serious look at and evaluate. Um, he, he may not put up the testing numbers necessarily some other guys do, but he is a really effective, good football player. So it'll be interesting to see where Texas goes on that. Caleb Chester, another uh, guy at corner uh, that Texas likes. He's officially visiting June 7th through 9th. Uh, then Adonis Curry out of uh, Quartz Hill up in Northern California in Lancaster. Uh, Texas uh, talked to him earlier this week. They're getting closer to setting an official visit date. We'll see. If that gets done, that would probably be June 21st through 23rd um, based on where his official visit schedule's at right now. So just a little bit on DB recruiting because, I mean, D-line gets a lot of the talk. Oh, well, because it's going to be a big class and there's 10 guys that are already have official visit dates. Um, and then wide receiver obviously is very popular in this class. Um, and then the intrigue with running back. But so DB's getting lost a little bit in this class as far as conversation goes, but it shouldn't be. It's interesting because – 
where the, there's so much depth in state at wide receiver and offensive line, and even D line is, is it may not factor in for Texas, but it's factoring for all the schools that recruit Texas. There's more depth on the D line than there has been. Um, at DB, it may not be quite as much for the Texas of the world. Uh, you know, look, if Devin Sanchez ever, if he ever called Texas, obviously the Horns would listen. Uh, so I want to put that out there. He's committed to Ohio State. But uh, so I think Texas is really looking out of state right now. There's two or three in-state targets, obviously. Cade Phillips at safety at high tower. We'll see if he can get that long jump out to 25 feet here at district or in regionals coming up. But I think he's uh, obviously a take at safety. Um, and I think Dorian Brew definitely would be at corner. So we'll see how DB shakes out. But some things are progressing towards setting up official visitors. And that's key because we have 33 or 34 official visitors confirmed right now, not counting Jordan Davis, who I expect to be on campus June 21st through 23rd. So that number's creeping up closer to 40, Bobby. I think it'll end up being about 40 and a half, 45. It sounds like there's some guys coming to campus this weekend, too, for the Texas Relays, Jerry. Uh, so they'll yeah. be on uh, running back out of morning, J.O. Osborne coming in uh, as well. And that, it, it seems like it's starting to get to that time period where we knew it was happening. We we're just waiting our time. A couple of visit weekends in April. That lay, ray, lays over until June after the, the May portal. Because remember, we got the portal coming up and open at April 15th. And then coaches can go on the road at the same time. I mean, there, there's a lot of different pieces to the puzzle right now. Uh, that are happening, but this next group is about uh, three weekends in a row. Texas will have people on campus. Then they'll play the spring game. Then the coaches are out on the road. The portal happens. I mean, it's getting ready to be uh, – recruiting is getting ready to be a hot mess. I'll just put it that way. <laughs> but hopefully for Texas, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, Naaman Roberts has asked uh, in the chat about Tory Blaylock, who's going to announce his decision here coming up. He asked what Texas recruiting uh, Tory at. Unless Texas makes a big push late, it's not going to be Texas there. Um, I'll say that. Uh, but it, uh, congrats to Tory uh, Jelani Watkins, the uh, uh, undersized slot receiver going to LSU. I mean, that was a long-standing national record in the four by one, and they didn't just beat it; they they beat it bad. So uh, they went under thirty-nine seconds in the four by one. Yeah, that's uh, that's incredible. Uh, that's uh, that's incredible. And I saw a lot of that speed. I uh, watched the Tascacita play Dickinson this year, uh, the first game of the season for those guys, I guess, last year. Um, and, and the speed at Tascacita on that team was very, very evident. All right, guys. Well, oh, whoa, hold on. We got to bring up Colton's question because a blast from the past question always. I oh love gosh, it. I haven't heard that name in forever. Do you guys yeah. know running back Daryl Scott that went to Colorado? I remember wanting Texas to land him so bad back in the day when I followed recruiting much closer than I do now. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bobby, do you what do you remember about that recruitment? I mean, I remember, look, so that was back kind of at the end of Texas having a pretty good run recruiting in the state of Colorado, right? I mean, you know, whether it's – Daryl was from California, though. Yeah, he was California. He was De La Salle. Yep. He was at Concord De La Salle. He ended up at Colorado. What do yeah, you remember I, about that one, Bob? By the yeah, way, yeah, go yeah, ahead. He basically led Texas on for quite a while. <laughs> um, that's that's essentially what happened. At one point, he was going to go to Texas, and then he decided not to. Um, I, I will tell you this. He had all the talent, uh, all the talent you would want, but I would say that he never really showed the tenacity yeah. to kind of get after it in practice, in my opinion. Um, and so I, I, I thought it was overrated at the time uh, coming out of high school, and he ended up truly being overrated overall. Uh, so, I, I, you know, there are a lot of cautionary tales in recruiting Colton and, and others. Uh, Daryl Scott is one of those. Uh, one thing that, that uh, strikes me always, and I'll say this, guys who don't have good senior years, at, it's in high school, and they aren't injured. Right. So if they're injured, it's a different story. But if, if they don't have good senior years and they're not injured, that that's that's a little bit of a telltale sign. Uh, you may want to you may want to pump the brakes on that. Hey, um, by the way, he, he led Texas on. By the way, since I, we mentioned De La Salle, Maurice Jones Drew, I noticed this going through the Texas relay heat sheets for high school. 
Maurice Jones Drew's son is a freshman running back at De La Salle High in Concord and will be running at Texas Relays. So if you're at Texas Relays, uh, either uh, today, tomorrow, or Saturday, and you see De- Concord De La Salle, and you see a fast, lo- lo- young-looking guy running in the uh, sprints on the relays, that's going to be Maurice Jones Drew's son at Concord De La Salle. Uh, hey, bring up – um. Hey, wait, I want to say this. I want to say yeah. this. Best high school running back tandem I ever saw in person was Maurice Jones Drew, great running back, and DJ Williams. Yeah. DJ Williams was a fullback, first round pick for the Broncos at linebacker, played at Miami. And Maurice Jones Drew were in the same backfield. There's a reason they won like 60 games in a row. Yeah. Hey, and by, by the way, that's back when uh, covering recruiting was really fun. Like uh, D- DJ Williams visited Texas, officially visited Texas, right? And that's when, you know, you could go down the 6th Street and on visit weekends, those guys were just hanging out. So I was walking around them there on that visit weekend uh, when I was young in the business and uh, DJ Williams was a part of one of those big Mac Brown recruiting weekends. But uh, Texas didn't beat out Miami uh, for, for the guy that was ranked number one in the country by some people. DJ Williams' mom... I used to interview recruits, and DJ Williams was one of those. And uh, DJ Williams' mom told me, this is one of my favorite little side stories about recruiting. Guess what she was? She was one of the dancers in MC Hammer's, Hammer, uh, you know, the MC Hammer song in the video. That That's where D- DJ was uh, very proud of that, because that was pretty popular back in the day. <laughs> that's crazy. Yes, I know. <laughs> you never know who's going to answer. On the other end of the phone. (laughs) That's wild. Well, before we get to question, guys, one thing that we need to talk about is women's basketball. Tomorrow, Friday, March 29th, 9 p.m. on ESPN. Uh, It's 9 p.m. Central. The first time that they'll ever have played Gonzaga, but in the Sweet 16. Yeah, so look, Gonzaga... For those that are going to tune in kind of for the first time, and I I, I watched a little bit of video stuff on Gonzaga just to get a feel for them. They may be a, the best three-point shooting team in the country. Uh, I believe they're – if you could – I, I don't know if we're going to bring up their stats. I believe they're a 40% three-point shooting team wow. for the season. And they've made 313 threes in 33 or 34 games. So they have two twins that are from the Houston area – uh, that are that are both made about 80, 90 threes. And they have a third girl that's made over 75. So you're talking about you have to guard the three-point line uh, Friday night if you're Texas. Uh, because if, though, if they get hot, you're, it's going to be a home game for Gonzaga. If they get a little hot from three, you're going to, you're going to, you could be in some trouble in that game. It's the best three-point shooting team they'll have faced this year and probably will face, period unless they come up against Caitlin Clark and she gets hot, which would mean a national championship game, which means you upset South Carolina to get there. So that's a long ways away. Friday, Gonzaga, those girls can really shoot the ball. Got to guard the three-point line. Hey, let's I, – Texas back, women's basketball put this graphic out, and Vic Schaefer, but three sweet 16s in the last four years at Texas, two yep. elite, uh, elite eight appearances in the last three seasons, nine seasons to 26 plus wins in the last 10 seasons. I mean, just phenomenal what he's done in his career, but also just at Texas in that short time. Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, and if Rory Harmon doesn't get hurt this year, he, he he's for sure, I think, going to add another final four to that. Now we'll see. Um, they, they, they're going to run into an issue in this next weekend. If somebody can get uh Booker in foul trouble early, they're going to run into it because the teams are so much better offensively. When you get to this level round of the tournament and women's game, Madison can't, if somebody gets her in early foul trouble, Texas could struggle in one of those games scoring enough points to keep up because I know Texas is going to play good defense, but people score against good defense when you get to this level, you know, so uh, I, I think Madison Booker staying out of foul trouble is going to be huge for Texas, but uh, Vix, uh, you know, I, I think he could easily, he won't, but he could easily win a coach of the year award nationally, because if you lost your point guard, who's going to be like a third team, all American level player and you're 12 and 0, uh most teams don't, don't aren't still the number one seed in the tournament. What he's done this year, unbelievable. And what it tells you, 
um, is he has a re- he has his resiliency, but his team uh, is a product of him, and that he can adjust on the fly and really maximize a team after it loses its preseason best player of the year, who happens to be the point guard. Not many teams overcome that in pro sports or college sports. If you lose your point guard uh, early in the season, most of those teams don't come back from that. Uh, so Vic Schaefer's done an amazing coaching job. And as crazy as it sounds, Blake, and I'm a believer in this with him, that graphic is awesome for Vic. His best days at Texas are ahead of him. So that I, that tells you where my confidence is and what he's doing with the Texas women's program. Well, Jerry, why don't you tell folks how they can build their confidence with Manscaped? Look, guys, I mean, I, hey, we had some Manscaped comments earlier. Before I get to the read, it's more – Just before I get to this, it's more than the lawnmower. Remember, there's the handyman, too. This goes with me on the road. All right, next. So uh, you got got your handyman, okay? But you also have your lawnmower 5.0. Guys, it's the, what does that say? Yep, that's what the Manscaped is. This episode is brought to you by the Spring Cleaning Champions Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below-the-waist grooming. Clear out that nasty winter bush with Manscaped's Lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like springtime flowers, like you're walking in to watch the first round of the Masters. That's the way you'll feel. The azaleas, all the spring flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code ONTEXAS for 20% off plus free shipping look i love this thing because it comes with a compact case as much as i travel i can take it with me everywhere i go spring cleaning doesn't just apply to the nether regions fellas get the full grooming experience with manscape signature beard hedger pro kit plus handyman electric face shaver and i'm going to say this one more time Do you want to be like Texas Tech fans and get Manscaped in Austin? Or do you want to buy Manscaped and do it yourself? Bravo. (laughs) Bravo. Job well done as always, Jerry Hamilton. You need to, I tell you, you need to send one to to Brett Yormark. (laughs) (laughs) You need to get his address. Send him one. (laughs) <laughs> oh man okay guys well we have a lot of questions to get to we got some super chats we need to knock out so we're gonna start with those and jay lee with the first one thank you jay he says can we all now take a minute to praise quinn ewers and his development bobby you touched on this a little bit ago things could have gone bad after that first bad season all he's done is work and get better oh i think he's 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 growing up man that's just, I mean, we all go through that at some point in time, right? Where you feel like, you know, football was fun or is fun to him. You want to keep that joy about the sport, but you also know you're going to go on to be a professional. Um, there, there's just no, no doubt about it. I've seen the progress firsthand on the field and we saw a little bit of it last year. I think we're going to see more of it this year. I, I do. I, and you'll see him against more difficult defenses too, by the way. So I, I don't know what the stats may look like, but you'll see a – I'm convinced, 100% convinced, you will see a better version of Quinn Ewers in 2024 than you saw in 2023. No doubt. Now, is it going to be this quantum leap? I don't know about that, but it's going to be better. I, I'm, I, very, proud, I'm very, very proud of him and how he's attacked the situation. He could have, to, to Jaylee's point, he could have went, you know, soft after the first year because he did not have a great year, right? He he tried hard and all that other stuff, but he's, he was a freshman. Sophomore year came back, led him to the college football playoffs. This year, I I, I don't know what he's going to do this year exactly, but he is literally uh, a guy that I'm, I'm impressed with uh, just how he's attacking it this offseason. And if that's the leader of your team doing that, that's a really, really good sign. I say this to uh, to add to what Bobby said is, you know, the game slowing down is always the biggest thing for quarterbacks. When everything's moving slower around you, whether that's in your peripheral, whether that's pre-snap, whether that's just the day before game and you're feeling the pressure of being the quarterback at the University of Texas, right? What Quinn said yesterday in the media session that life has slowed down for him, 
that means everything's slowing down for him. Because if life is moving too fast, man, it's hard to just go to the field in the game move really slowly. So I think it, you know, to me, I, I, I kind of liken it to a pro golfer in a way. I mean, you know, just that everything's got to slow down around you, right? I mean, you got to learn how to breathe, right? And you got to have everything's got to be at a good pace and everything's got to be calm uh, around you in your life. And uh, I, I think what Quinn said yesterday is a big reason other than having 20 plus starts, being in year three of a system. Um, because I, I really think the quarterbacks now at these big time universities, everything that comes with it that's different now from an NIL perspective, Bobby, the demands on your time, you don't really have a chance to be a kid at all. You're, you're thrown into a true professional world now. You're not the average college kid, even the average college football player five years ago. Um, so ha being able to slow everything down from your day to day in your life and carry that to the field is so key. And if Quinn's starting to feel comfortable in that regard, which I think is hard for these guys nowadays, I think that's a great sign for Texas. Our next super chat comes from Juan. Thank you, Juan. And he says, Bobby or Jerry, why are the refs at practice? Uh, they are there to call. They'll they'll get in a little bit of hey, that was holding that or, on it's particularly, I will say this, particularly on defensive backfield. Okay. So that's really what they're they're out there for. The off uh, the uh, wide receivers, DBs. Now, when they go to team. They won't set the ball or anything like that. And it's not a full group of officials unless it's an actual scrimmage. It's about three to four that rotate around to different drills, et cetera, uh, and are calling things. And, you know, it's not a full on thing, but it, it's interesting because I think Sark likes to make things a little realistic. And so they're just out there uh, making sure that the, the guys know uh, you can't do that. I'd flag you for that, et cetera. And probably helps them have a little practice. Yeah, I mean, well, I don't know. I don't know about practice. They're probably getting paid to be out there. But yes, <laughs> a I, mean, it, it's a common, I want to say this. It's a common occurrence. It's not just Texas. Uh, just about every school I know of does that as well. OK, and then I've seen this asked a few times, guys, so we'll get it out of the way. Too broke to pay attention. Bobby, yesterday you said we may get some basketball news. Did I miss it? If not, can you give us a hint? And then Jeff Collins as well. Any basketball news we should be hearing? It was a little. I, I will let Jerry take this uh, because it's uh, it's we're waiting on some portal stuff and what may or may not happen. So I'll let I'll let Jerry take it from there. Yeah, I mean, I think naturally, uh, you know, we'll see what happens with uh, Dylan Mitchell and Tyree Turner. There's been a lot of backroom chatter on that. Uh, I I I would be surprised if either guy was back. Then you have some guys in the portal that are start starting to pop in there. Uh, that have Texas attention. A couple of bigs, uh, Brandon Garrison, Oklahoma State being one who Texas finished top three on coming out of high school when he was a top 40 type recruit in the country. Uh, so Brandon Garrison's a guy that, that Texas is working, trying on. Uh, they need two bigs out of the portal. One of those guys has to be able to shoot it, though. Uh, but the other one needs to be more of a rugged rim protector, wall-up defender. Uh, then I think point guard uh, in the portal, even though Trey Johnson will have the ball in his hands, in that Zoom offense, that kind of chase, get action in the ball screen game. He'll have he'll have his hands on the ball. He'll play in the ball screen game. But Texas needs a point guard to help the transition of two future NBA draft picks. I think two future first rounders at guard, but they're still going to be freshmen in college basketball. And if you watch Kentucky, you know that's very difficult. Um, so I think point guard. Then I think a wing shooter. Uh, Devin Pryor is going to be a good player. I think next year he'll he'll start to really show some of those signs. He's a true wing in college, not kind of a four they're trying to fit into a wing. Uh, so I, I think four guys out of the portal, maybe one more high school guy, uh, will kind of set the roster for next year. And while we're on the subject of the portal, let's go over to the football side of things. Uh, he too broke to pay attention. Says outside of the Michigan defensive tackles, are there any rumblings of particular players or other positions besides defensive tackle? that the staff may be targeting. The only one, the only other position I think right now is punter. Based on what I've seen, unless somebody, unless they just have a, a a litany of people leave that I don't expect. I mean, six to eight, I don't think they take anybody other than punter and defensive tackles. If they start getting cut 
deeper at defensive back than maybe they anticipate. Maybe they go there. Uh, but other than that, I don't I don't see them going for much in the portal other than defensive tackles and punter. Unless, of course, the caveat is always if a difference maker goes in the portal, that's a top 10, top 25 pick, whatever, say Will Johnson from Michigan, the corner. I mean, unless it's somebody like that, I, you know, I, I don't see that. And I don't, I don't anticipate Will Johnson transferring. So, uh, but my point is, uh, I, I think Texas is going to look at defensive tackle and punter. Could they go one other guy if, it, if the situation merits? Yes, but not anticipated right now. I bring up Antoine's 847 question. He asked that twice, and I think it's actually a really good question. Um, yeah, I, I so when I say faster team, one through 85, I don't even think there's any question this Texas team uh, this year is going to be faster. Um, you know, DJ Monroe wasn't much of a factor, right? So, but is is Jaden Blue faster than Daje? I would say yes. I mean, I, I, I think Marquis Gooden was a – Olympic level athlete, but I think as a whole, when I talk about fastest team with Texas, I think they're a much faster team than that group as a whole. And, and it spreads across multiple positions, both sides of the ball. Yeah, and so we're not just talking about wide receivers and running backs. We're talking about DBs, linebackers, uh, tight ends. A guy like Amari Nyblack counts in that regard, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I think it's a. When Jerry talks about that, I, I I nod my head in agreement, not because I think that, I mean, they're not faster than Adonai Mitchell and uh, Xavier Worthy in, in a, I'm talking about the whole whole roster, much more athletic overall, uh, as well as I really think they do have uh, speed in general. I, I mean, you got, if you think about this Texas roster right now, I mean, Look, I mean, you go back to Xavier Filsa me. He, he ran 10-5-5 as a sophomore in high school, then was injured during track his junior year, obviously, or early enrollee here. You can go down the list of this roster, and there's a lot of speed, and a lot of speed that hasn't even been seen on the field yet. Um, some of these early enrollee guys, obviously. Ryan Wingo, look, he ran 10-5-5 in high school, 10-6 in high school. So there are a number of guys on this team that have football speed, they have combine speed, then they have track speed. So I think as an overall group, yes. Is there any one guy as athletic as Marquise Goodwin on this team? No, but I'm not sure there is in college football, period. <laughs> I mean, right. I, I mean, he was an Olympian level guy. So um I, I just I just think this team as a whole, I mean, and when I consider I, I'm talking about Colin Simmons, Trey Moore, you know, all these young guys at all these positions, Ty Anthony Smith. And a linebacker is an extremely athletic football player. Uh, so you just kind of – Darian Gallette is a hellacious athlete. Uh, Jare Bledsoe, unbelievable athlete. So just the whole program, 1 through 85, speed as a team, I think is the best it's been in two decades. Right, Jerry, one more time to shine for you. I need you to get your glasses on and tell <laughs> folks out there how they can look good at, with Gooder. Look – this is the one time I'll do a read with shades on and show you a pink flamingo, okay? That's all I got to say. It cleans my glasses. It's a great little case. Why gooder, you ask? Besides these being my favorite glasses now, which I wear everywhere. Um, these stylish sunnies start at only $25 a pair. No slip, no bounce, all polarized, and all fun. If you go read the reviews, over 50,000 five-star reviews. I'll be 50,001 when I get around to doing mine. Uh, I'm giving them a couple of weeks, but they're awesome. It's <laughs> pop art for your face. They're 100% polarized and only $25 mm -hmm. uh, because they're so affordable. I never worry about losing them or breaking them, right? I mean, that's the key. You're in the ocean, you lose your glasses. You're not losing $200 pair of glasses and hitting your thigh saying, God dang, I shouldn't have had my fifth beer at 1230, right? <laughs> These bad boys are $25. Great for running, cycling, working out. I'm testing them cycling this weekend, by the way. Working out, golfing, going to the beach, hiking, or just chilling on a Texas media open media window practice field. Here is the key. If you want to show the support of the show and try a pair, Gooder is giving – on Texas football listeners, free 
shipping. You can go to gooder.com backslash on Texas all caps and use code on taxes on Texas all caps for free shipping. Gooder offers a 30 day money back guarantee and 100% satisfaction. Again, that's gooder backslash on Texas all caps and use on taxes for free shipping. And all the last thing I'm going to say, I wish my gooders good luck cycling this weekend. <laughs> Oh, man. All right, guys. We're going to move on here. Still a lot of questions and a lot of time to get your questions in, so please do so. And uh, yesterday, this new, I think it was yesterday, this news came out about Ohio State. But Colton wants to know, do you all have any thoughts on Ohio State having a nationally televised spring game? It's going to be on Fox. Kind of interesting, in my opinion. What do you all think? They're, Fox is trying to get into college sports a little bit heavier now, which I actually think that's that's more of the news to me. Is not necessarily that it's Ohio State or anybody else. It's that they're trying to bring – Fox is trying to bring a little bit more to the college football stage. They started with the big noon kickoff, right, to compete with uh, college game day on ESPN. And now they're, they're trying to take it that one step further, which I think is actually good for the sport. So whether it's Ohio State or whoever, I actually think that the idea that, that uh, Fox is trying to – dip their toes into what has traditionally been ESPN's stranglehold, right? Because what I call is it's shoulder programming, right? CBS, ABC, um, Fox, all these teams, of all these uh, broadcast companies have always done a good job, relatively speaking, of broadcasting the games themselves. Where they have fallen short, everybody except for ESPN, is the shoulder programming, the things you see outside the games. Well, it's it, from my vantage point, for the first time ever, it looks like Fox is actually trying to compete with ESPN on a national level exactly. on this on the shoulder programming. So that's that's my big, bigger takeaway, Blake. Um, ESPN, I'm not saying they're going to have competition because they still don't because they're so – they're just – they are the 800 pound gorilla, but it's nice to see college football get those uh, opportunities. And while we're on the subject of spring games, fellas, Joshua wants Joshua wants to know: Can you tell us the plan for the spring game? As far as yeah, play- yeah, absolutely. So right, as of right now, we're expecting we're going to have a host a pregame uh, near campus. I, I, I cannot announce that official site yet, but we've got it squared away. Uh, and then we're going to be on campus for the game. I don't know that we're going to have a live during the game, but we will be on immediately following it. Uh, and uh, we'll we'll make sure everybody has the uh, news and notes on that uh, as well. Uh, but we want you guys to fill out. Feel free to come out and join us. We're also going to have a happy hour, I think, on that Wednesday or Thursday before the spring game if you're in Austin. And I think I'm going to try to buy everybody at least one beer. I'm not buying multiple beers, by the way, but one beer. So... Please come out and join us at that point in time. And then Zane Petty says, you bring up Tua's completion percentage, Jerry, in Sark's system at 69% and 71%. In 2020, Mac Jones was 77.4 completion percentage in Sark's offense. I think Quinn can have 75% or greater. Your thoughts? I, I think that's tougher. Um, I'd have to see your, like really how, how far they threw the ball down the field, Mac Jones versus Tua. Um, if it was a little bit, a sh- little bit shorter, um, a little bit less, uh, I'd, I'd have to check that. But I, I don't, I don't see that. I'd be surprised. I, I think if you're in that 72, 73 percent area, that'd be a heck of a year for Quinn. All right. Then this next question here uh, from Juju Juice. He says, "Is Nansen bringing any new schemes to the defense?" We talked about that this morning off off air. Jerry and I did. We think he is. Uh, now, how much of it uh, will be a good question? Uh, Texas may play more one high uh, this year uh, based out of it. Uh, it's not unlike what they did uh, at Arizona. Uh, but, uh, look, I mean, how much Pete Kwiatkowski is going to sway from what he has traditionally done mm-hmm. is a good question. And furthermore, how much he should sway based on what he's done and the results he's gotten in the particularly last year is a good question. But I do think Texas is willing to, to attempt to do some different things. And I do think that they're going to work. 
that they are working on them right now in spring ball. Jerry, what you have a anything different to add? No, I think that I think that's correct. I think that is a uh, um, somebody pointed out what Nansen does. I, I do think that the, what you said is going to be true, Bobby. I think you're going to see more of that. Hey, I had a question for you, um, yep. Jerry. I, you mentioned one of my favorite players, and I've talked about it in this recruiting class that is Smith Aragbo, uh, the defensive lineman out of A. Leaf Hastings. Where, where are you? Where what's going on with him exactly? Because I I was so busy yesterday, I didn't quite understand. He, he set an official visit. Is he also coming in for an unofficial as well in the next two weeks? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I so I think uh, so. Smith Rogbo will be in April six for an unofficial visit. That we we had broke that news a few weeks ago. And here's Smith Rogbo's uh, junior huddle six five two eighteen. I think about a sixteen seventeen shoe. Really come came on as a junior this year. Just got more confident, stronger, played more physical. Uh, but he'll also be on an official visit June 14th through 16th. That's a big weekend for Texas at the edge position. That I that's when Lance Jackson's coming. I actually talked to Lance this uh, um, I actually uh, talked to Lance Jackson this morning, and then Hayden Lowe, uh, the uh, edge player out of uh, Westlake uh, Village Oaks Christian, uh, he'll be in uh, that weekend as well at the edge position. So three of the very top targets for Texas at the edge position. Will be in June 14th through 16th. Your competition, I think, with with Smith or Ogbo right now, it's going to be USC. It could be Oregon. Oklahoma State's making a big push. AM's trying. Uh, Oklahoma's maybe there. So uh, I think this is a guy that in the spring evaluation period, while he has 31 offers, I think with him kind of blowing up without as much foot traffic going to Hastings High School, I think you're going to see more schools come through there in May and see if they can get in the door with Smith or Ogbo. But uh, Really much a big upside guy. That frame is a ways away. Um, he may be 225, 230 uh, by his senior season. We'll see. Like I said, he was 218, 216, 218 when I was through there in December. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll see where that how long it takes that frame. It's kind it's similar to Zena. He's got a similar frame to Zena. I think he's a little bit further behind where Zena was because Zena had an older brother, obviously, uh, and those guys trained together. Then Zena trained at the facility uh, up with uh, uh, Nathan Daughtry there in the uh, McKinney area. So I think Smith, the road goes behind where Zena was physically, but their frames are very similar. I got to say this. Long arms and quickness. Yes. On defense, winning combination. Yes. Uh, and that's what Smith and Rogba has. I mean, typically that's a hugely winning combination. Long yep. arms and quickness. And he you can tell from that video, he has it. And another defensive lineman uh, that we've had quite a few questions about is Zion Williams. And he says, Jerry, what's the standing in his recruitment? The defensive tackle out of East Texas. I, I really still believe LSU and Texas are 1A, 1B. I think LSU is 1A, Texas is 1B. I think AM's third, and I think TCU's probably running fourth there. Jamarcus McFarlane, obviously one of the great recruitments between Texas and OU. The D-line coach at TCU from Lufkin High School, distant relative of Zion Williams. So TCU's going to get that May official visit, third through fifth, one of their big weekends. Uh, Zion will be Texas spring game April 20th. He'll be back for an official visit June 21st through 23rd. He's a very, very, very much a priority recruit for Texas. He's seen as a guy that's over the ball in the SEC, what Texas is looking for, what Texas needs. Same thing with LSU, same thing with AM. Uh, so we'll we'll see where it goes. I think LSU is going to get him on campus. He was on campus once before. He'll be back for their spring game April 13th. Uh, so then an official visit, I believe June 7th through 9th will be his official visit to LSU. That could flip be 14th through 16th. Uh, but I do think the LSU and Texas are battling this one out. It's an intriguing one because – Obviously, Bo Davis has been recruiting him for a long time, uh, and now at LSU and Texas, the staff has been recruiting him for a long time as well. Uh, Zion was impressed with Kenny Baker's visit in January. I, I was through Lufkin High in late January, and Kenny Baker had been through there, I think, two or three days before, and he was really impressed with that initial meeting with Kenny Baker. Uh, so I, I think it'll be interesting to see if Texas can – kind of overtake LSU. What LSU has for going for them in speaking with Zion is that Baton Rouge area, it feels very much like Lufkin East Texas to him. So that that's one of the things 
that, that there's a comfort comfortability feeling there. So we'll see. I think he, I think the academic athletic piece at Texas is very intriguing to uh, Zion though. Hey, I got to ask you, I got to mention this. Hey, Blake. Yeah, uh, you, you reported something in baseball yesterday about Tanner Witt. Can you explain exactly what's going on there and, and where he's at? Because this is—he was supposed to be a key piece of the returning puzzle of the Longhorns this year, and it sounds like he's going to be on the shelf for the foreseeable future. Uh, Longhorns have a big series coming up in uh, at Kansas State this weekend. Yes, yes, they do. And if they can win two of those three, they should be in first place uh, in the Big 12 race. But back to Tanner Witt. So he hasn't pitched. I looked it up since Texas Tech, which was probably about three weeks ago or so. Uh, a lot of Longhorn fans wondering where he's been, where he's at. And uh, the the news is, is that he's injured. But to what extent or what that injury may be, they're not exactly sure yet. What I was told yesterday is that they are going to get him checked out. Um, a little more in depth, I guess, to figure out what's going on. But the timeline on that is obviously unknown as they don't know, you know, what exactly the issue is. So it could be one day, it could be one month, one year, who who knows right now. But uh, yeah, that's a, a major piece of the puzzle that Texas could use. That's just not there. It's missing at the moment. Yeah. They said Ace Whitehead, he was the, he's been the Saturday starter after LeBaron, uh, LeBaron Johnson on the Friday starter, they feel like they have a good one, two in the rotation right now and trying to find that third. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so last week we reported on, on Texas football that Ace Whitehead should be a, a major contributor going forward. And then Saturday he came out, pitched a complete game, 117 pitches and, uh, you know, helped Texas get that win over Baylor. Looked pretty good in my opinion. And, um, had the lowest ERA, I believe, uh, on, on the weekend of the three starters, but, yeah, he, he should be that, – that should be the status quo going forward. LBJ Friday night, and then Saturday it will be ace. Um, and then from what I hear, they're getting pretty close to what they believe the weekend rotation is going to be from here on out, you know, knock on wood. <laughs> hey, hey, I want to go back to that the, uh, the question about the completion percentage at Alabama, which I thought was, it made me look real quick on that, uh, the double-check stuff that I'd looked at. What will be interesting when you think about Texas offensively uh, with Quinn in 2024 is 2019 at Bama with Tua when he completed 71% versus Mac Jones in 2020 when he completed 77%. 42, 44 more passes for Mac Jones that you were completed the running backs and tight ends. So that's 42 more completions on more of the short passing game uh, is shorter in a short intermediate passing game there with Mac Jones in 2020 versus two in 2019. Now, I, I remember the 2019 being much more of a downfield passing uh, attack with Tua, uh, but that was a difference 40 over 40 catches more in 2020 for running backs, tight ends combined versus 2019. So, the one way you can creep that percent completion percentage up in Sark's offense to that 75 76 area is if there's a lot more passing game into the tight ends and running backs. All right, y'all. This next question here is going to be from Emmanuel Villafranco. And he says, does the play development and pre-draft performances help Texas recruit bigger frames slash quality defensive backs? I think that's just more finding those guys, uh, Bobby. I, I just think it's casting a wider net for those guys, knowing exactly what you're looking for. Um, but, I, you know, I it's it's I always caution this stuff. I mean, I, Texas has to have a certain amount of length. You have that. You can't have three. Uh, sorry, Rod, baby. You can't have three, five, nine corners running around in the SEC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry, Rod. You can get me next show. Uh, but look, I at the same time, I don't think. Bobby, you can cookie cutter these guys. I think that's making a mistake. Uh, it, like right now, that like if by, if I told you about DeSoto had a D tackle that was six foot two seventy five with arms arm length a little shorter than you ideally want, I'm not sure Texas would recruit that guy right now. So I think you got to kind of be careful cookie cuttering guys a little bit. Or a five eleven defensive tackle from from a uh, Hilton Head, yep. South Carolina in Puna Ford. I mean, you're right. I mean, at the end of the day, it's player 
over size. It always will be. I, I, I'll never forget Darren Sproles. Yes. Right. Looking at him on the hoof, you wouldn't take him ever. Okay. He lit Texas up like a Christmas tree. I mean, so you just, you, you would not, it's always player over size. And, and I do think that, that college coaches uh, don't, they, they traditionally have not had the support staff like uh, NFL teams have when it comes to evaluating players. So college coaches are trying to be not only recruiters, but they're also trying to evaluate. They're also trying to, well, in, in pros, they have different people that do different things, right? Uh, and still, they get it wrong in the pros at times. They go for height, weight, et cetera, over uh, actual performance. And I believe that I believe that that's where a lot of people get recruiting wrong. That's where a lot of people get the NFL draft wrong. I'm not saying that those guys don't come around every so often, but the reality of it is, is that uh, performance over prospect, performance over prospect. Because you have to play fast. Um, you, you mentioned that, and I, I just think of JT Sanders. JT Sanders was a five-star prospect and all that because he was big and played wide receiver and had soft hands and all this stuff. But the thing that I I see now, after going to pro day, he's average speed, Jerry. Yeah, he's four seven, even it, and a less explosive athlete than others at tight end. But JT Sanders, when he runs a 4-7, he plays a 4-7. There are going to be other tight ends that run a 4-5-5 that play a 4-9. And that is the difference. You know, you, you, you want performance over prospect, ultimately, if you're going to create the best team. Because the best teams don't have the best prospects. They have the best players. That's the difference. All right, guys, this next one here is from Jody Reynolds. And Jody says, stop with Trey Moore being the second best player on defense. Ethan Burke, you guys give him no respect. How would you answer that? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I got black eyes here. I just got hit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I got to put my gooders on to protect me. Golly. Um, now, look, I think Ethan Burke may, may go to the NFL draft after this show. show. I'm, I'm very high on, on Ethan Burke. Um I think he's going to ascend from year two to year three. Uh, so I, I'm very high on Ethan Burke. Um, you know, I, I I actually think he may have a decision to make after this year. And if guys have a decision to make, they're tremendous football players. I just dis disagree that we're disrespecting Ethan Burke. Trey, Trey Moore had 14 and a half sacks last year. Let's just be clear. He and, he and Anthony Hill are the two who I think are going to be the two most productive players along with Jaday Barron. So those three, those those will ultimately end up being your most productive players. Baron Sorrell is going to be good. Uh, Terrence Brooks is going to be good. Uh, Alfred Collins is going to be good. But I'm telling you, Jerry's not out of sorts with that with that comment at all. And I've been to I've been to two practices, and it's not a uh, it's not a shiv in the back to to Ethan Burke to mention it because. You know, it can't, it doesn't have to be either or. That's the great thing about this. It doesn't have to be Ethan Burke or Trey Moore. It can be both Ethan Burke and Trey Moore. And uh, that's how I look at it, Jody. All right, guys. This next one here is uh, from Kelly at Horns Up. And they say, How do you see the position groups compared to last year? Are they all better except maybe defensive tackle and linebacker? I definitely would agree with defensive tackle. Um, linebacker, I think, is going to be more about uh, experience, uh, and I do worry about that probably the first six games of the year. I think that Jalen Ford is a, is a, was a good player and a good leader overall. However, I also think that he wasn't necessarily a plus-plus athlete, and so after about six games, when Anthony Hill has been calling the defense for – uh, six games, I think some of that will dissipate. And so early on, yes, on linebacker. Later on, I don't I don't think so. Defensive tackle, absolutely, because Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy, frankly, are two of the better, maybe two of the top three or four defensive tackles in the entire country last year. 
Before we move on to the next questions, Bobby, I'm going to let you tell folks out there about Rick Favreau and Austin Underground one more yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. Rick doesn't just own Austin Underground. He also owns Texas Road. And those two companies can work together uh, to help you uh, and specialize in underground, difficult commercial inst installations that also include road work. Uh, the team's engineering background gives Austin Underground the ability to perform work other firms often consider too risky. Rick and his team offer an end-to-end -end client experience, including seamless communication, budgeting, staffing, and top-notch trade partners. And most importantly, they produce solid quality work you can count on each and every time. That's Austin Underground. Thank you, Rick, uh, for your support of On Texas Football. Then we have lots more defensive line questions, especially after some of these uh, last ones here. So we'll start with Ivory, Ivory Martin. And he says, could Texas have three edge rushers drafted, Trey, Burke, and Sorrell? Not out of the question at all. Uh, that's not out of the question at all. And I think Texas could have four or five guys you look at next year on the field and say, all, the, all those guys may end up in the NFL one day. I, that's the depth that Bobby was talking about earlier. I think Texas is too deep of guys that will probably get drafted at edge, whether that's second round, third round, fifth round, seventh round. Uh, I think Texas is going to be too deep with draftees at that position. Does that mean Texas is a top three edge unit in the country? I'm not saying that. What I am saying is they have a lot of really good depth. So it's the most surprising depth on the team. That's what we started talking about right at the, right at the very start uh, is really, really that. And so, I, I feel like that is the most surprising depth on the team. The addition of Trey Moore really helps that. The health of Colton Vosick helps that. And then you have young guys like Colin Simmons and uh, Zena uh, Umiozulu. Those that guys, that's a that's a good looking group of players right now for the Longhorns. And then Tong Mu Tong says, "Who are the two starting edges on opening day?" I think that they're going to play a, a four-man rotation right now, Tom, and I believe that it's going to be uh, Moore, Sorrell, Burke, and Finkley. So long as Fink Finkley could be a, a, a potential portal prospect. I don't think he will be, but uh, that's where that's where this is going, guys. I mean, I'm just telling you, they've got guys right now. They've got guys. And a lot of that who's starting depend depending on, you know – where these guys are lining up at the two different edge spots, right? I mean, I would think Baron Sorrell and Burke walk out as your game one starters, but does Ethan Burke also play uh, some snaps over where Baron Sorrell does this year, right? To get Trey Moore and Colin Simmons on the field. I think that's how it'll be interesting to see how it all plays out uh, in August after this spring. Okay, our next question here comes from Michael Rodriguez. He says, good morning. After multiple practices in the books, which position group has st stood out the most so far? Quarterback. I would say, yes, quarterback. Um, for what we see in the media window, right? So we're not there for the team where the helmets are hitting helmets, right? So uh, I think offensive line, for me, just because of the depth. I mean, it's just the depth at center, the depth at left guard. Um, and I've said this before, but six years ago, you couldn't entertain the thought of Hayden Connor taking snaps anywhere other, other than left guard as a multi-year starter. You couldn't – Cole Hudson would have come off a major injury and come back and just walked into his starting role again six years ago at Texas. That's the difference is there's so much real depth and real competition – that's been created through these recruiting classes, none from the portal, as Bobby pointed out, straight high school evaluation, coaching, and development. Um, I, I think offensive line, that depth is very strong. I'll say the most improved position uh, is safety. Uh, I, I just think it's a faster, more, more athletic group as a whole. Um, and the one thing I've been told is, uh, Xavier feels to me, we had reported, okay, physical guy. I've, I've been told Jordan Johnson Rebel is, just as physical, just a different frame, and and, and not quite as four four when he hits you. Uh, but Jordan Johnson Rebel is a very physical player as well. Which anybody that wa watched him at IMG or listen us talk about him at IMG, that's not surprising because the IMG coaching staff said 
He can play in the box as well as he can off the ball. He has that physicality. He has that mindset. But uh, I think the speed, the athleticism, and the physicality at safety have, have gone up about three or four notches. And then you have Makuba, who's really savvy, been really good. Sarkeesian singled him out. And Derek Williams in year two is going to be the best of all the safeties. So I think that's the most improved position. Best position on the team. I, I'm just telling you now, Texas has a chance to have two one ones at quarterback. Just now, I, I love the offensive line, Jerry, and I agree with you. They have, they may have six or seven draft picks on the offensive line right now. Okay. But, yep. And, and so I'm not, I'm not saying no, but quarterback right now, they got some talent, guys, real talent. And I'll say this too if you look at a position room, who has the most future throws per capita is probably going to end up being running back. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you could, you could literally see four or five out of the six. Yep. Wow, uh, y'all, we have good, time good for place, Good place to be. Yes. Time for just one or two more questions. The first of those two is going to be a super chat from Justin Yarbrough. Thank you, Justin. He says, Jerry, is Texas still looking at the athlete from Texas City? Uh, Xavier Scoron, I think, is who you're asking about, a safety at the next level. Uh, I I don't. We'll. I'll double check with him today. See if there's been any movement of late with him. Blake Gideon was by in January. That's his recruiting area. He went by to, to take a look at him. I know Missouri. Uh, there's a few uh, Power Fives that have him uh, scheduled for visits either in April or official visits, but in June. I, I'll double check with him. I haven't heard anything on that lately, but I will double check today for you. And then our last question, fellas, comes from Joshua Bratton. Thank you, Joshua. He says, is there a position group that you guys may be worried about that may surprisingly be a strength, such as running back last year? No. Um, look, I expect a lot out of the corners this year, Jerry. Um, Terrence Brooks looks really good to me. Like he's to that point about growing into an adult. He's taking that step. I, I do believe that he's being a leader at corner. He's not a real talkative guy in practice, but he's doing everything. He's leading every drill. I think Manny Muhammad, from what we've been told, is a little bit of a football. I, Rod would call him a football investigator. I mean, the story I was told about Manny Muhammad, just to pass this on, is that he asked for the film from last year's first spring practice before this year's first spring practice so he could check out and see what else was going on or what they were going to run through most likely on installation days that's how far ahead of the game he's thinking uh then you have guys like Warren Roberson who I think looks good uh we've talked about uh Wardell Mack and Jerry mentioned him a little bit uh Kobe Black in there as well and then you have guys that can rotate down possibly like Jade Barron who by the way I still can't get used to him wearing the number seven right now in practice. I was looking at him again. I'm like, who is that? Oh, oh, wait, uh, John Bianca go, oh, that's John A. And I was like, uh, I, you know, you can't get used to a guy wearing a new number like that if you've seen him three years in a different number. But um, I'd say corner maybe looks a little bit better than maybe most people, people would uh, perhaps think. I think Texas has, I think Terrence Brooks and Manny at their strength are press corners too. Yes. And the one way you can play more press is if you have better athletes and better safety play. And better pass rush. And better pass rush, which ties it all together. Okay, guys. Well, it's about time to get out of here. Is there anything that y'all are working on for OnTexasFootball.com? Any, any videos coming up people need to be aware of? I know it's Thursday. Yeah, we have we have the winning drive at 4.30 with Coach Shipley. Uh, Rod Babers and C.J. Vogel will be some recruiting news on there, as well as some team stuff that Rod's going to be talking about. I also want to say this. Y'all need to go check out ontexasfootball.com. Jerry had a nice article on the team, some insider notes on the team this morning uh, that I think is uh, very valuable. We also have football theory later today as well. And I got to say, we, uh, we guys, we are inching closer and closer and closer to that 40,000 mark uh, while the show is going. We hit 39.9. 
thousand subscribers. That's amazing. Thank you for your support. If you haven't already, we would definitely like for you to hit that subscribe button, the like button, ring the bell so you're notified anytime that we go live. Tell your friends. I mean, we cannot do it without you guys. And then if you can't ever get on YouTube to watch it, we're on Spotify. So you can subscribe there, leave us a review. And if you're not a Spotify person, Apple Podcasts, man. So we're, we are absolutely everywhere. And like I said, we just could not do it without you guys. We can't thank you enough for all the support that you've given, especially as we inch closer to that 40,000 YouTube subscriber mark. 166 days till kickoff. Thank you, Rob, for that. And by the way, thank you to our sponsors, Gooder, Manscaped. I can't do the reads at the same time, but I can show you at the same time. <laughs> okay well that's gonna do it for today's episode of coffee and football uh presented by rick Vavro and austin underground we want to thank them for sponsoring today's show along with gooder and manscaped as jerry just said thank you all for tuning in and for bobby burton and jerry hamilton i'm blake monroe and we'll see you tomorrow morning